been in a series called In God We Trust. Everybody say, In God We Trust. In God We Trust. You know, we're living in times that are, you know, tumultuous. If that, I, guess, I guess that's the right way to say it. There's a lot of turmoil, a lot of, a lot of confusion, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred. And we need to trust God. And, uh, you know, that this series in particular is, is dealing with finances and money. And, uh, you know, we live in a, in a money-oriented society. And we're not an agricultural society like when man was created. Uh, now we have, have uh, we deal with money. And so we need to trust God with our money. Amen? Amen? And, you know, thank God we live in a nation where we literally have those words, in God we trust, on our, on our currency. You look at a dollar bill, you look at a nickel you look at a quarter you look at any any currency and you'll see the words in god we trust and uh that that's good first timothy chapter 6 verse 3 we'll just kind of read the the foundational scripture here verse 3 of chapter 6 first timothy if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words even the words of our lord jesus christ now he's talking about Dealing with the, the first two verses of this chapter, he talked about our attitude. Uh, about you know, if you're if you're a servant, then you need to have a servant's heart. Uh, serve the, your master as unto the Lord, and he's dealing with the attitude. Your attitude is real important when it comes to really. It, it's a part of being godly, because it, it goes on and says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, if I say doctrine, the doctrine which accords with godliness. So now we, we are new creations. When you're born again, you are a new creation. Amen? If I say I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. So when you're born again, you're a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. But so in the on the inside, you are godly. But there is godliness, which is the way that we act, the way we respond to things. You may not be responsible for things, but you are respondable to things. Amen? So we have to learn how to have the right attitude with anything that happens in our life because the right attitude will keep you in on solid doctrine. Uh, if, if your attitude comes out of your doctrine of faith and trust in God. You know, there's, there, if we're not careful, we, we emphasize faith, and, and we do emphasize faith. Without faith, it's not possible to please God, right? But there's also trust. You know, faith is, is that, that just that dogmatic stand that, you know, no, no matter what the devil or anybody else throws in my path, I'm going to stay on it. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to, I'm going to serve God. But trust is something that's... It's akin to faith, but trust is in the area that, that it, I think it takes you beyond faith. It takes you to the point that, that you know, I, I'm going to trust God. You know, we can trust God because he loves us. In one place, Paul said, casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. Casting your cares on God, that, that's part of trusting God. When we cast our cares over, him, over on him, we can do it because he cares for us. You know, I, if, if you don't care for me, it's hard for me to trust you with my cares, with my burdens. Amen? But if you know that somebody cares for you, then you know you can trust them with your burdens. So we know that God loves us. Amen? Everybody say, God loves me. And I'll put it this way, and you've heard me say this before. The degree that you are not willing to cast your cares over on God to that same degree, you don't know how much he loves you. Because it, it's really, the, if you really know how much he cares for you, you can cast your cares over on him. Amen? And so this is part of our doctrine. This is not just some nice thoughts. This is part of our doctrine. 
He goes on and says that, that, uh, that if, if anyone teaches otherwise about these attitudes and, and, and trust in, in God instead of in man, if anyone teaches otherwise, then uh, it, it, uh, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, and suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. That's a pretty low state to be in. And what got us that, to that point, or what gets you to that point, is not having the right attitude. When your attitude goes south, everything goes down the drain. If you don't have the right posture in your attitude of trusting in God and looking and, and, and serving as unto the Lord, then everything else is going to be out of line. You can have all the money in the world, but if your attitude is not right, you're not going to be happy. Amen? He goes on and says, uh, Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Everybody say godliness. godliness with, contentment with contentment is great gain. Is great gain. Great. And so God wants us to have great gain. But there is a right way to do it. There's a wrong way to do it. The wrong way to do it, you can have a lot of money but not be content. And we've seen that. We've seen multi, multi millionaires that are not happy because they, they've got to get that next deal. They've got to get that next million and nothing satisfies them. If you're not content where you are, you won't be content where you're going. Now, contentment does not mean that we settle for less than God's best. But it means that we are sufficient in ourselves where we are. Yes. That's what the word content means. If you look it up in the Greek, it literally means a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. Paul wrote in another place to the Philippians, he said, I have learned, everybody say, I have learned. I have learned, I have learned how to be content in every state I am. I've learned how to be, have lack. I've learned to have an abundance. You have to learn how to live with not enough so that you can learn how to live with more than enough. Now, that doesn't mean that God wants us to be poor. Remember, God wants us to have great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Or you could put it like this. Godliness with contentment brings great gain. There's all kinds of scriptures in the Bible that talk about how that if you obey the Lord, if you walk with God, that God will prosper you. Deuteronomy 28, <clears throat> under the Old Covenant, it says, if you'll hearken unto the, all these laws, all these commandments, then I will bless you. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. And it, talk, it lists just verse after verse after verse of abundance and blessing. That's under the Old Covenant. The only problem is nobody could fulfill the law. But the good news is that Jesus came and fulfilled the law and removed the curse. Jesus took the curse and left the blessing. God wants you to be blessed. But said, so God wants me God wants to, be to be blessed. In fact, I did a whole series on the blessing. And I remember the, the very first words that came out of Jesus' mouth in the first recorded, documented sermon in the New Testament. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And what's the first word of that sermon? Blessed. Amen? Everybody say blessed. blessed. God wants me to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. We've got to get that in our way of thinking. God wants me to be blessed. I expect the blessings of God. Not in an arrogant, prideful way. Remember, he started off by dealing with our attitude. Having a servant's heart. Having a trustful heart. I trust God to bless me. Amen? Everybody say, I trust God to bless me. And then we talked about uh, how that we need to be careful that we don't give and, and handle our money out of manipulation. 
we handle our money and give out of a cheerful heart. Amen? But we do give. Everybody say, I'm a giver. Amen? But we give out of a cheerful heart. We give because God is after our heart. Amen? Under the Old Testament, there was the law. But tithing and giving started at creation. When God put man in the middle of the garden, he gave them everything in the garden except for that one tree. And he said, that tree is mine. You don't eat of that tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a beautiful tree. It was a good tree. Eve looked at it under the spell of temptation from the devil and looked at it and saw that it was good and desirable, one that could make person smart. Now, how can you look at a fruit and say, you know, that's going to make me smart, right? It had to be some kind of beautiful fruit. Amen? So everything in the garden was good. But God didn't want us to live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted us to live from life. Amen? And so the first documented sin after the Garden of Eden. After the original sin, the first documented sin in the Bible was when Cain killed his brother Abel. And he killed him over the results of an offering. Or over, you could say, put it like this, he, the first sin was over money. If you, if you really relate that to our terminology. Everybody say the first sin after the garden, was over money. So money has been at the root of a lot of problems and it's at the root of a lot of blessings. Money in itself is not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Amen? And you can be guilty of that and be completely broke. You can be guilty of that and be a, a bazillionaire or you can be guilty of that and be completely broke. You can be homeless and be guilty of the love of money. So it's not how much money you have, it's how much money has you. Right. Amen? So Cain killed Abel because God had respect to Abel's offering. We talked about this in the series. Remember, Abel gave of the firstborn of his, of his uh, flocks. Cain gave, it says, in the process of time, <clears throat> In the, in the Hebrew, that word literally means in the end of time, Cain brought of the harvest. He was a tiller of the ground. So at the end of time, the end of that cycle would have been the end of the harvest time. So Cain brought the last part of the harvest. Abel gave the firstborn. And God respected and received and honored Abel's. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews that God testified of Abel's gift. When God testifies about you, that's a good thing. God. How many of you want God testifying over you? Amen? Now, now that, that means that God spoke good things. Remember, God's the one that said, let there be light, and light came into existence four days before the sun was created. Amen? Think about that. When God says, let there be light, there's light. If God said, let the light be blue, you better believe the light would be blue. Yes. Amen? Amen? What God says happens. Right. And God testified over Abel. That's how Cain knew the favor of God was on Abel's offering. Somehow, some things happened to Abel and his life and his, his possessions, his flocks, that Cain saw that God had favor on Abel's offering and not on Cain's offering. Amen? And so when God blesses you, you're blessed. And, and we talked about how that God wants the first. Everybody say the first. the first. And that's because he loves you. The first fruit, if you have $100 and you give the first $10 to God, then that leaves $90 that God can be involved in your, in your life and bless you with. If you go through $90 and give God the last $10, how much is left for God to bless? None, right? So God, in His love and wisdom, wants us to give Him the first fruit, not to punish us, 
but to bless us. Amen. Amen. That's the love of God in operation. Now, today, I'm a, oh, and one thing, we're, the, the last thing we talked about last week was when did Jesus become poor? Because in, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, everybody say, thank God for the word. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. I say he became poor. He became. Poor. He didn't just start losing money and over time he was poor. He became poor. That means something happened and he became poor. He became poor. Poverty. It's the same terminology that he became sin. He became sickness. Amen. He became poor for us. That through his poverty, we might become rich. So when did Jesus become poor? Jesus did not walk on the earth as a homeless person, wandering around from handout to handout. Jesus came as a giver. You can't be a giver if you have nothing. Jesus came, and everywhere he went, they gave to the poor. Everywhere he went, he healed people. Everywhere he went, he did things that blessed people. Amen? Amen. When did he become poor? The same time he became sickness. The same time he became sin. Jesus became poor. And it's important that we understand that, because if you think Jesus walked around as a poor man, then who am I to be any better than what Jesus was? But Jesus walked around in an abundance of provision. When he was born, several world-renowned seers or kings or prophets, whatever they were, from far off, they called them magi, which we get the word magicians from, or people that can see things, they saw the star about Jesus. And they came thinking that that star represented a king had been born. So they came to Jerusalem and asked ask around, and word got to Herod, the king, that they were looking for the king, the new king. Well, that got Herod upset. And so they found the star. They found Jesus in Bethlehem. But the Bible says that they came with camels loaded down with gifts. Gold, everybody say gold. Gold. Frankincense. Frankincense. And myrrh. But say it again, gold, gold. Frankincense, frankincense, and myrrh. and myrrh. Now, gold, we know what that is. That's been the, the monetary standard forever. That our wealth is measured by gold, really, uh, somewhere. Now, it used to be that our economic system, our financial system in America, was literally bound to gold. It's not anymore. But we still recognize gold as, as a meter of how wealthy someone is. If someone has a lot of gold, they're very rich. Amen? So Jesus was given gold. Frankincense was a very costly <clears throat> perfume, a very costly fragrance. You, know, you see, hear the word incense in that. It's, it's, it was a fragrance. It was a very beautiful, lovely, costly, valuable fragrance. And myrrh was another type of fragrance, but it was used... In, in, in uh, old times, it was used as an embalming agent to preserve a body at death. And all three of these things, I believe, were connected to and tied to and symbolic of what Jesus needed to do what God called him to do. He needed gold. Amen? Everybody say, he needed gold. He needed gold. Gee, he needed the anointing. He needed that, that fragrance of anointing that attracted people to him. When somebody smells good, you want to be close to them, right? When somebody stinks, you don't want to be close to them, unless you're just really abnormal. <laughs> Amen. But when somebody smells good, you, know, you want to be, you enjoy their be, being around them. You ever walk through the mall and somebody's got some new cologne or new perfume on that that you hadn't smelled before, but it smells really good. You just want to walk up. Sometimes you walk up. Hey, what are you wearing? That smells so good. Right? Jesus had a fragrance that attracted people to him. Amen? So the frankincense. Before Jesus was crucified, remember the, 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 the uh, harlot came with the alabaster box and opened it up and poured costly fragrance 
over on Jesus and anointed his head with that oil, caused a stir. But that represented the anointing. That represented anointing and empowering Jesus to do what God called him to do. And then when Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night, came and took Jesus' body and brought myrrh, the, the, the preservative, myrrh, the embalming type of perver preservative fragrance, and wrapped Jesus' body and put him in a, in a rented tomb. And so all three of these things represented what Jesus had, what he needed, and what he would do, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And then when Jesus walked on the earth, his, his finances were supported by the wife among others, by the wife of Herod the king, his financial steward, Chuzza, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, supported Jesus' ministry. So Jesus did not walk around as a poor man. He became poor when he was crucified. Amen? Now today I'm going to talk about, I, I, I was watching a little bit of uh, Brother Copeland's uh, Voice of Victory program this week. And, and Gloria was on with George, Pastor George uh, Pearson. And uh, they were talking about prosperity. They were talking about, about uh, and it kind of stirred up a memory. Uh, Pastor George mentioned that he had heard Brother Hagen, Dad Hagen, who's in heaven now, talk about how that when he was first in the ministry, that uh, he kind of struggled in his finance initially. And, and then God gave him a word and instructed him how to turn around his finances. And uh, I'd heard Brother Hagen tell this story several times over the years, uh, back when I was at Lakewood, when he would come and, and speak at some of the conferences and some of the pastor's meetings and things like that, and, and was in a, a number of meetings with him. And, and I've actually heard him say this, but it kind of stirred up a memory on that. There were three points. Everybody say three. Three points. I'm not going to get through all of them today. I know that. You know me. But we'll get started on the three things. I'll tell you what they were. The first point that Jesus told Brother Hagin, and this is good for all of us. Amen? Number one, everybody say number one. Number one. Claim what you need. Amen. Everybody say, claim what I need. Claim what you need. If you need $1,000 a month, you need to claim $1,000 a month or more. A little, a, a little over just in case. Amen? Now, again, we, our need is not just based on our personal need. Our needs are bigger than, than me. My needs are bigger than me. Your needs are bigger than you. <clears throat> we need to always have a vision that is bigger than ourselves. Yes. Amen? So the first point is claim what you need. Everybody say, claim what I need. Claim what you need. The second point is, Satan, take your hands off my money. Everybody say, Satan, Satan, take your hands off my money. Take your hands off my money. Now, this is what Jesus told Brother Hagin, and it worked for him. And I know it was a personal word for him, but there's a lot of wisdom here. And so this is something we can apply to us. Number one, claim what you need. Number two, Satan, take your hands off my money. Take authority. Everybody say, I have authority. The devil is defeated. Amen. Number three is commission your the ministering spirits to cause the money to come in. And this is something we don't talk a whole lot about, but we have angels. There, this room is packed with angels. That's right. Amen. There's a whole lot more here than what you can see. Amen. Every one of you has angels that are assigned to you personally. Sometimes they get a little frustrated with you. But every one of us has angels, at least a couple of angels, at least. Because the Bible ta talks in, in uh, let's see here. Where, is, where did I put that? Matthew chapter... 18 verse 10, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels, plural, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. I don't know about you, that's pretty comforting to me. 
we have multiple angels that guard and watch over us and protect us. There have been times that I've been going through things. One time I was, I was sitting at a red light and the light turned green and I started to give it the gas and I didn't, without even knowing what I was doing, I stopped and hit the brakes and a car doing about 70 miles an hour just blew through the intersection. Amen. If I hadn't have stopped, I, I'd have probably been killed. Amen. And I didn't even realize that I was stopping. I believe an angel grabbed my foot and moved it over to the brake. Yes. Yes. You can believe what you want to believe, but that's what I believe. Right. We've had things, all of us, have, if you stop and think, you've all had things that you've been through something and it's like all of a sudden things changed and you were spared, you were saved. One time our daughter Crystal was walking out of Children's Church when we were still at Lakewood and they had a children, the, the church had grown so fast they had just makeshift buildings set up and they had a, child, a, a building set up for children and she was walking and somehow got away from the teacher it wasn't the teacher's fault. It just things happened. But she got away and started walking. And there was a car that started coming through. And Rachel was walking outside. And she saw that. And she said, Crystal. And all of a sudden, it was like her body just instantly just moved out of the way. And was in, in the car missed her. Amen. I mean, it was just a miraculous thing. One time, we were having a conference at Lakewood. And, you know, it was one of those things where we had three or four meetings a day. And Rachel was worn out, and she said, I'm going to go home, or I'm going to go over to some friend's house, and I'm just going to relax for a little bit you know, before I come back and uh, to the meeting the, in the evening. And she called me uh, that before the meeting. She said, that I locked my keys in the car. Now, I'm not going to say anything, but that happened quite a bit with Rachel back <laughs> in those days. I'm not going to mention any names, but Rachel had that happen quite a bit. In fact, she was known for locking her keys or losing her keys. If she wasn't locking them in, she was losing them somewhere else. But thank God for grace Amen. for me. I mean, uh, so she, she called. She said, the keys are locked in the car. She said, I, I, so I don't know what to do. We're, we're, well, we're, you have to be here. And she went out there and she said, in the name of Jesus, I just come in this car to unlock and, and pull on the door handle and boom, the, the car, the door just opened up. Amen. Miraculously. Amen. Now, I believe that we have angels that help us. They're not seen. Sometimes God opens our eyes and we can see things. But we have, and so we're going to talk about that. But the first thing is claim. Everybody say claim. Claim, claim what you need. Mark 11, 23, or 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. Everybody say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, and Jesus immediately puts us into action. Listen to what he says. He had just got through saying that if you have faith, if you believe, that you'll have whatever you say when you pray. In verse 24, he says, Therefore, I say to you. So he is enforcing what he just said and applying it to us. Everybody say, therefore. therefore. Anytime there was a, the, the word therefore is there, you got to see what it's there for. Amen. Amen. He had just got through saying that if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, but believe that those things you say will be done, you'll have whatever you say. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. And we can forgive because Jesus has forgiven us. Amen? Amen. But listen to what he says. When you pray, believe that you receive them, 
and you'll have them. Amen? Amen. There's a, there is power in claiming what belongs to us. Amen. I'm not going to claim what belongs to you. That would not be right. Amen? But I can claim what belongs to me. And if God has given me something, I have a right to claim it. You know, every every year or so, I'll I'll listen be listening to the radio or watching TV and they'll play a commercial that this we live in Texas. The state of Texas has fifteen billion dollars worth of unclaimed properties, and you can vote go to this website and look up and see if your name's on the list. Anybody ever seen those commercials or heard them? You know, banks have lists of unclaimed accounts. People that have opened a bank account years and years ago and, and moved around and they forgot that they even had a bank account. And, and you know, you can go to websites. There are websites that you can go anytime and look and see if you have any unclaimed possessions. Amen? Hold up your Bible. Everybody say, this, this is my list, is my list of, unclaimed of unclaimed possessions. Amen. Amen. So anything in this Bible is for you. Amen. Amen. It is something you have a right to claim. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's, that's good stuff. Amen. Unclaimed possessions. We all have unclaimed possessions. Amen? Amen? If we'll get serious about our unclaimed possessions, God gets serious about them. Amen? Amen? We have a better covenant based on better promises. If you see a promise under the old covenant that's conditional to the law, then you can rest assured we have a better promise under the new covenant. Mainly because it's, for the first first point, is it's not conditional to the law. Jesus already fulfilled the law. Now, there are some conditions for us when it comes to our unclaimed possessions. First, we've got to believe. Everybody say, i got to believe. You can't just read the Bible and say, oh, okay, well, that must be mine. We'll just wait and see if it happens. If God and, and I, I've heard people say, "Well, if God wants me to have it, He'll give it to me." Yeah. And you may have even said those words. I try not to ever say those words, because He wrote a book and gave it to me that lists what He already wants me to have. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. If if you have a rich uncle that died and you were his favorite nephew or niece, and you go to the reading of the will. And they, the lawyer stands up and says, "Okay, here's you know, a thousand dollars is going to you know Ruby over here, and a hundred thousand dollars is going to James, but Janita, you're going to get the house, and you're going to get the Rolls Royce, and you're going to get, you know, the 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 fifty acres of, of of you know, the the neighborhood that he built, and all the rent houses and everything. All that's going to you." Now, you're not going to sit there, sit back and say, well, if he wants me to have it, I'll get it. <laughs> no. Now, you're going to, after, after you get through shedding the one tear that you're going to shed over losing your uncle, <laughs> you're going to jump up and say, where's the keys to my house? <laughs> How soon can I move in? Uh -huh. Now, you're going to try to do it politely right. and, you know, respectfully, but you're not going to be ashamed to ask for it because... Uncle Rufus wanted you to have that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he put it in writing for you. Amen. Now, people can fight you over it, but you've got the will. Amen. God's word is his will for you. There are unclaimed promises in his word that belong to you. They've got your name written on them. Amen. I heard somebody say one time, I can't, I can't remember if it was Brother Hagen or somebody that had a visitation, had a, had a dream, and they went to heaven. And Jesus was taking them and showing them. It may have been Pastor Osteen, somebody. And, and, 
it, they got to a room and there was a bunch of limbs and body parts and everything and, and he asked, he said, what is that? And he said, those are the body parts that we've reserved for people that they never claimed. And all of us, I believe that, that when we get to heaven that, that Jesus will wipe away all tears. I believe some of the tears that we shed will be because we realize that there were things that we didn't ever claim that we, that we should have had. Right. Amen? God wants us to claim. Everybody say claim. claim. If you're struggling in your finances or any area, the first step is, first of all, you know, recognize you have a need. Amen? you got to wake up. Everybody say wake up. Wake up. And some people are just ignorant. They're, they're broke and they don't even know it. But you need to know where you are. You need to know where you stand. Because if you don't know where you stand, you don't know what to claim. Right. Amen? But if you know where you are, then you know where you ought to be and you know what to claim. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the first step is claim. And that puts you in the position and posture of faith. Because we have to believe. you you gotta, you got to believe. You can't claim something you don't believe. But when you believe, you can claim it. When Uncle Rufus wrote in his will that he wanted you to have all that property, this is not a prophecy. Well, I don't know. It could be. I don't know. Do you have an Uncle Rufus? Oh, okay. I, I didn't know how. I know you're redneck. I just didn't know how redneck you were. So I, I'm very redneck. I had an uncle named Mutt. So. That's, but. Yeah. But when your uncle wrote in his will that you that's that belongs to you, that gives you a basis to believe for that property. It settles it for you. Right? Now we have no problem with understanding that when it comes to this natural world. We need to be just as committed and just as clear and focused with the word of God as if Uncle Rufus died and wrote in his will he wanted you to have all of his property. That's what Jesus did for us. Jesus died for us. And the new covenant, the new testament, the new will. When you read a will, it is a testament of what that person wants you to have. The new testament is the testament of what God has done for you. And there's no guilt or shame that should keep you from getting it. Because Jesus took all the guilt and shame and condemnation on the cross. Amen? And, and that's one thing I want to, I'll just kind of close with this. You know, there, there's scriptures that Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Everybody say yesterday, yes. today. And forever. and forever. Jesus is the same. Amen? He loved you yesterday when you made the mistakes. He loves you now when you're overcoming the results of the mistakes. And He will love you to the future of when you are in victory. Amen. But you got to see yourself now under the authority of Jesus and the love of Jesus. He is the same. He didn't, he's not condemning you for your past mistakes. Every one of us have made mistakes. Every one of us have made bad investments. Every one of us have had, can look at things in our life and say, well, that was a flop. I mean, Thomas Edison, how many times did it take him to invent the light bulb? Somebody said, well, how did it feel to be such a failure? He said, well, I just found out a lot of ways that weren't the way to do it until I got to the right one. Amen. We don't stop. We learn from our mistakes, but you're not a failure. I love Brother Osteen used to always say, you're not a failure, you're a learner. But I say, I'm not a failure. I'm, not a failure. I'm, a I'm a learner. And so Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's, he's the same yesterday when you made your mistakes or when you did the good things, whatever. Jesus is the same yesterday. He is the same today. He is with you right here and now. You can trust Him with what you need today. Amen. Amen? 
How many of you have needs today? All of us do. I mean, you know, you may just need a lollipop, but you may need a new car or a new, new, you know, tractor, or whatever, new suit, whatever. Whatever it is you need, we have needs today. Jesus is the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he will be with us forever. He's the same forever. Even the book of Revelation talks about uh, a revelation of Jesus Christ who was, who is, and is to come. Amen? Everybody say was, was is, is, and is to come. And claim the first thing. We talk about claim what you need. Don't let your misconceptions of what has happened in the past determine what you claim today. Let the reading of the will determine. Yes. I, I mean, I, I've heard stories of people that didn't have anything. I mean, they, they had been a failure all of their life and, and a relative died and left them something of great value. But if you're not careful, you can, you can inherit something but still have the mentality of the failure. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He'll take care of your past. He was, he is, and he is to come. Don't let yesterday's misconceptions, yesterday's failures, or even sometimes yesterday's victories can limit us because we can look at it like, well, look, this is what I did in the past. And you can limit yourself today because of what you've done in the past. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we claim, don't let the past determine what we claim. Let the reading of the will settle what we believe. It's not based on our, how, how smart we are. It's not based on anything we've done. It's based on what God did when he sent Jesus. Amen? So claim it. Everybody say, I claim it. Everybody say, I'm part of the name it and claim it group. <laughs> Amen. I know they make fun of fun of us for preaching faith. But listen, this stuff works. It's what Jesus lived by. He created the world with his words. Yes, he did. Amen. And we're created in his image. So we gotta claim, we gotta start talking the blessing. Start talking the provision. In God we trust. Amen. That bless you today? Hallelujah. God is good.